Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Nonviolence International YouTube channel and our Spotlight series. My name is Nimesh Wajewardene, and today I have the privilege of speaking to the legendary professor George Lakey. Uh, George Lakey is a retired professor of peace and conflict studies at Swarthmore College, an activist, sociologist, and author of several books, including How We Win, A Guide to Nonviolent Direct Action Campaigning, and Viking Economics, How the Scandinavians Got It Right and How We Can Too. He has been active in the Ban the Bomb movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the LGBTQ liberation movement, the anti-apartheid movement, and the climate movement, to name just a few. He was first arrested in 1963 at a civil rights protest in Chester, Pennsylvania, and he co-founded the Earthquaker Action Team, which won its campaign to, to force PNC Bank to stop financing mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia. He is a civil rights legend and an expert in nonviolent direct action campaigns. Professor Lakey, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> so to start off, uh, you first began your activism with the civil rights movement. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was wondering what inspired you to join the civil rights movement and how does it feel now reflecting back to be vindicated by history and by how lauded the civil rights movement has been in American history? Well, I was lucky. I got a great start. My family, a blue collar working class family in a small town in Pennsylvania, uh, was very uh, concerned about racial justice. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my dad used to start up arguments at work at his workplace, he would say, I think we ought to have a black candidate for president so we could vote for him. And the others would jump on him and they'd have a, a big argument. And then he'd come home very happy and, and telling us all about it. So, uh, so I was brought up in that kind of family and also by my church, which was an evangelical church, which preached that, uh, that uh, the Christian God that we know is a God who believes in uh, loving all people. And so I had that head start. However, uh, and of course, I participated in some of the support picket lines. I was based in the north. Uh, so we had support picket lines for the struggle in the south, which was going on, especially with the civil rights movement in 1960, when there was a lot of uh, effort to get support in the North as well. But uh, but what really got me going most fully was that in a nearby industrial town to my town, which was Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, uh, was a mass movement that was copycatting from the Southern movements. Uh, and it was mass, non-civil non disobedience and so on. And of course, I was reading the papers and paying attention to the TV. And nearly all the people shown participating in that movement were black. Hmm. And I thought, well, this is outrageous. Anybody, uh, anybody white anyway, ca casually looking at this struggle from the outside would think, oh, well, uh, black people are trying to solve their problem. Hmm. <laughs> but this is white people's problem. <laughs> this is what hmm. we created. Right. It wasn't as if black people were sitting around saying, we'd like a challenge in our lives. It was white people who came up with this thing <laughs> called inequality and injustice, and it's our job to deal with it. So I went right out the next day and uh, joined the, the struggle and got arrested for the first time, which was scary. And, uh, and I got beaten by police and I thought, well, mm -hmm. this is the classical thing that we're supposed to go through. And, uh, you know, and, and, and then had a glorious week in jail where the jail was full of black people singing, teaching me new songs, marching, even inside the jail we were marching. Wow. It, was, it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, so from then on, it was a, a very rapid series of events. I got to be on the training team for Mississippi Freedom Summer 1964, that kind of thing. Okay. That's amazing. Um, and how do I feel about that? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, I mean, you know, every generation that comes along in our country is more free of racial prejudice and, uh, and discrimination than the previous generation. Mm -hmm. So one can see it continually, continually, continually getting better. But of course, the push needs to 
needs to remain. Mm. And uh, one of my criticisms of the civil rights movement was that in the 1980s, under the impact of, uh, of Ronald Reagan and that sort of rightward push that happened on the national level, the civil rights movement went on the defense mm. along with the labor movement. Most of the major movements, social movements of that day went on the defense. And as you'll find out, if you ask any basketball coach, Go to your high school and talk to your basketball coach or your football coach <laughs> and ask, um, how, how do games work out when you go on the defensive? <laughs> they will tell you, never go on the defense if you want to win. The only way to win is to be on the offense. Uh, so there were uh, the civil rights movement and other movements did go on the defensive, not all, but most. And, uh, and of course, lost ground, lost ground, lost ground, lost ground. So now it's a question of regaining ground and, mm -hmm. uh, and and the Black Lives Matter movement was, was a dimension of that. That's a great transition um, to my next question. Obviously, the fight for racial justice continues and goes on. Um, it's been more than a year since the killing of George Floyd and the mass protests of the Black Lives Matter movement. But mm -hmm. despite this protest movement, the federal government has failed to pass police reform legislation. So I wanted to get your thoughts on where the Black Lives Matter movement has been successful and where you think it might have fallen short? Where it's been successful has been in leaping over the uh, racial barrier and getting actual involvement from white people. Mm. In my state, Pennsylvania, it was remarkable. There were towns, based, pretty much all white towns <laughs> in my state, where people had demonstrations for Black Lives Matter. And uh, it was just, it, it rocked my world that this was happening. Fortunately, the Philadelphia newspaper, which uh, tries to cover the state sometimes, uh, got on the phone and called around to some of those towns and said, uh, you know, is that the kind of thing you folks do? <laughs> and one of, the, one of the outcomes reported in the paper was uh, the, this one town talking with an old, guy who'd been around forever, you know, who said, oh, no, our town never does demonstrations. Well, come to think of it, I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was a rally by the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that town went from <laughs> zero or less than zero, if you call the Ku Klux Klan, to a, a Black Lives Matter uh, demonstration. Mm -hmm. so, so that is an extraordinary thing for that movement to leap over the racial barrier. Uh, however, uh, it did not, its leadership did not learn from the successes of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement did campaigns that had specific goals. Integrate the buses of Montgomery, Alabama, right? <laughs> the students in sit-in after sit-in. Integrate this lunch counter. Integrate this library integrate this swimming pool. It was always very clear what they were going for. And the opposition always knew, oh, this is what they want specifically. Do we want to give them or not? And how long can we hold out? Okay. That was not done with the, the question of public safety. Instead, mm. this terrible slogan came along, defund the police, which was ridiculous. We might as well have put on our signs pie in the sky. I mean, it, it was a totally ridiculous thing. A majority of black people was appalled. Mm. <laughs> Majorities of black people in, for example, Philadelphia would hate the idea of they're not being police. Mm. Um, defund the police. So talk, talk about uh, t t tone deaf. And, and, and the pity of it is that not having done the homework, for one thing, Movements are always more successful. We know this from the study of social movements. Movements are always more successful if they come up with the specific thing that they want. Mm. Medicare for all. Green New Deal. Specific things. Integrate the lunch counters. That's what we want, right? So the fact that they did not do that, even though there's plenty of criminological uh, brains around, academic, you know, people who could, who could help. There are models in other countries. The, uh, the Britain disarmed their police, what, a century ago or more, and, and so on. You know, I, I lived in Norway, never saw a police officer carrying a gun. What a ridiculous idea. Uh, there, there, there's plenty 
of opportunity to develop a vision of what public safety would look like, how it could be redesigned and look and, and, and appear. And uh, that work was not done, that homework was not done. So the tragedy for me, I went to some of the demonstrations, of course, out of solidarity, but the tragedy for me was to actually get the ear of America for the first time in a major way on the police issue, police brutality, police misbehavior to get the ear of America and not have something to propose mm -hmm. as an alternative to armed police running around hurting people, that's pretty unforgivable. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is that the, the alternative lesson that they could have learned was there in their own tradition, that is the, the black uh, civil rights tradition. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I uh, yeah, o over and over I keep saying, let's learn from what works. That does not seem too hard a principle. It, you know, lawyers try to do again what worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so do business people. So do engineers. So do paper hangers and people who will paint your house. They will learn from what worked before. Let's try that, folks. That seems like a very, very reasonable thing to do. <laughs> so you you frequently talk about the importance of campaigns and how movements seem to have forgotten about the power of campaigns. I was wondering mm -hmm. what, why do you think campaigns have sort of fallen out of favor by social movements? I think it's partly the uh, domination of too many movements by uh, professional middle-class people. Mm. Uh, professional middle class people um, see um, see social change work as a morality uh, opportunity and mm. an opportunity to exercise and express moral uh, positioning and so it 's all a matter of who is more correct than whom right very much about word play uh, what are we calling it this week as compared with last week what we were calling the 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 correct line. Mm. Uh, it's, it's about virtue signaling, I'm correct, you're not, mm -hmm. instead of getting specific pieces of justice accomplished. Mm. <laughs> so instead of taking on, and, and it's not that these people don't know how to like, you know, get a car fix or something. They do mm. in their regular lives. They know how to you know, in, in college, they know how to get their A's if they really want an A on that exam. Uh, they know how to do that. But when it comes to these issues of right and wrong, they see them in moral terms, moralistic terms, instead of seeing, well, then how do we get this thing to happen? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the failure. Mm -hmm. That's the failure. This is not a moral game. It is not an opportunity for you to flex your moral muscles. This is an opportunity for you to change something. That's what we have to get across. And the pushback, I, I think, needs to come from, uh, especially come from uh, people brought up working class because people brought up working class don't always have the luxury of spending all of our time uh, you know, uh, refining moral positions. We need to get shit done. So how do you get it done? That's the point. And I think um, this is then, the, uh, 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 from a sociological point of view, the sadness of the split between um, uh, classes. Mm -hmm. that is, there's a split between working class people and uh, middle class, professional middle class people uh, too often when it comes to organizing social movements. And both sides uh, pay uh, grievously for that. I never really thought about the class divide in that aspect and how it would mm -hmm. impact social justice organizing. Um, mm -hmm. to, go, to go back to an, the earlier point about defund the police, I remember that summer, um, obviously I'm a young person, I was a college student, a lot of left-wing college students really rallied behind this idea of defunding the police, abolishing the police. And I, I suppose part of that is young radicalism, wanting to, you know, fundamentally not just change the system, but like abolish the system entirely. So I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the necessity of idealism and of sort of this imagining a utopia, imagining a better world 
while balancing obviously the need to actually get shit done and accomplish realistic goals. Absolutely. Well, mm. on, on almost every issue you can think of, mm. I come out on a more radical end rather than on mm. the more reformist end. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and so most, most people want to reform capitalism. Mm. I want to pretty much, uh, you know, give it the kibosh and so on. Mm. So, um, so I very, very much think uh, that that is a legitimate position because I'm usually thinking it on almost any issue. The thing is, I also know that in order to bring about radical change, it requires even more power mm. than it does to bring about reformist change. Mm. And so I just try to make an, a, an estimate of power. Mm. You know, it's, it's like maybe my ideal would be to, to build a, a 1,000 acre farm, I would love to run a 1,000 acre farm. And I only have enough money for a 100 acre farm. Mm. Well, you know, I could just pine away for the lack of my 1,000 acre farm. Or I could buy the 100 acre farm and mm. hope that I can attract more people to pull their, and, and together we can have a 1,000 acre farm. So I pay attention to the means as well as the end. Mm. And I love radical ends, but radical ends require uh, extraordinary means, mm. which means a, a historical opportunity, which doesn't come every year. Mm. doesn't even come every decade. It only comes every once in a while. Mm. And that's the wonderful thing about Marxism, because Marxism keeps saying, hey, look at where you are in history. Because what we're doing the name of my next book is Dancing with History. <laughs> I wish the Marxists had used that phrase because it sounds a lot more lighthearted than, than yeah. scientific <laughs> material. But, yeah. but, uh, but uh, let's dance with history, folks. And, uh, and, and you're just going to be out there on the dance floor dancing by yourself if you don't pay attention mm -hmm. to history. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the historical opportunity comes, now when I, I'm going to be on the radical side, uh, push, you know, joining those organizations, taking part in those actions when that when that opportunity becomes available. Mm. In the meantime, uh, did I refuse to, uh, to, you know, get arrested for civil rights because it was going for reformist goals in that particular city that had to do with hiring practices and so on? No, of course I, I do that too. Mm. So, so. I, I'm committed to move the dime as far as it can be moved, but I so much want to move it way farther yeah. than uh, usually we have the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. That is a great point about radical ends and means. I think that the way you sum that up is a great way to think through the whole radicalism versus reformism debate. Um, thank you for that. That was really insightful. Um, to switch topics a little bit, when I was sure. doing research for this interview, I read in The Guardian um, that you acted as an unarmed bodyguard for human rights defenders in Sri Lanka. And I'm Sri Lankan, my parents are from Sri Lanka. I was very interested in hearing about this, if you could talk more about that experience. What a beautiful country you come from, your people come from. I was rocked by how beautiful Sri Lanka mm. was. I have never, I've been, you know, I've been on five continents. I've done training on five continents. I have never seen a more beautiful country than Sri Lanka. At the time, however, it was a blood-soaked country. Mm. And, uh, and as you know, uh, but maybe not all of our listeners know, in that period, uh, I became aware because there was a new organization getting started by some of my friends hmm. called, um, uh, well, what was it called? Peace Brigades International. Peace hmm. Brigades International. It's just getting started. And, uh, and the head of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka had come to that group and said, look, um, we, we had this real problem because some of our lawyers are human rights defenders. They really want to defend human rights. And a great thing about Sri Lanka, even though it is experiencing two civil wars at once, which puts tremendous stress on the government, which means that civil liberties is really in question. Mm -hmm. uh, but because uh, the, the, there is that residual uh, you know, loyalty to the rule of law, and we do have 
a lot of wonderful lawyers and I'm in the Bar Association and I know these people and I know that they want to defend human rights as far as they can. Now, the thing is, there are now gangs of people assassinating my lawyers if mm. they are taking the side of human rights because human rights is getting in the way of you know, the prosecution, you know, the, the fighting is going on. And so I... Uh, and and, and um, I went to the president of the country and I said, come on, you got to help out because I'm losing my lawyers. They're, they're getting out of town. They're going, going off to Britain or whatever to save their lives. And some are already killed. Uh, and so I need your help. And the president of, the, of my country said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. There's nothing I can do. And right. so uh, I'm coming to you as an extra uh, you know, an, an, an international agency and asking, is there something you can do? Uh, I've heard that you offer human rights protection. You offer civilians who will come and be nonviolent bodyguards. And I want you to do that for my lawyers. <laughs> so my friends said, George, we're putting together an emergency team uh, we don't have time to do the language training that we would like to do. We, you know, we, we usually uh, have, have time to really get in place a, a major thing, but we're, we're pulling on a couple of experienced people who, who had been in El Salvador. We're asking, will you be willing to go to Sri Lanka? Then no, you don't know where it is on the map. And George, would you join them? So we have at least three people to start. And then with a start, you know, we hope we can build a real team and, and do this properly. Um, and I said, hey, you know, what, what, a, what an important cause. Keep people alive in that situation. Of course I will. And, I, and I've never done this, though. So I, I need your training. And they said, well, we don't have any training yet. We're a very new organization. <laughs> so I thought, okay, there's a, a, an appeal of that to me as well, because I do like innovation. That's my history. I love to invent, invent, invent. So this was an organization inventing stuff, and I'd be right there in the beginning of the invention. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. So I went over there, and it was, it was, it was so moving to me, the courage of the people that I was accompanying. I was basically non bonded bodyguard, which meant the lawyer would say, now I need you to do this. Okay, I, now I'm going to go here. Come with me. Boom, boom, boom. Um, the, the, most, uh, the longest period I spent with the lawyer was in the, the, the old city of Candy, mm -hmm. another gorgeous, gorgeous place. And this man said, I, I don't need you to come to my law office like you were in the last one where you were sitting there in the law office. Um, but uh, my law office is very, very safe. Uh, however, uh, the lawyers in my city are at risk and at their homes. The hit mm -hmm. squad comes, rings the doorbell, the lawyer goes to the door thinking this is a distraught parent whose youngster has been picked up by, uh, you know, by, uh, you know, some side or other uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, or, or been picked up by the police, picked up by the police. And, and so he wants me as a lawyer to go and do habeas corpus and get, get this youngster released before the torture has gotten too advanced. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so lawyer goes to the door, opens the door and boom, he's dead. So, uh, so the lawyer said, what I need you to do is sleep in my house. And then when the doorbell rings at night, you get to go to the door. <laughs> Got it. Said I, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so Nimesh, I spent three months of the most scared <laughs> time of my life. <laughs> and uh, what, uh, what I contracted for was three months. I, I served my whole three months and then um, I was hugely relieved to go, go come back <laughs> home in one piece. <laughs> and, and um, uh, Peace Brigades International, uh, PBI, as Peace Brigades International, uh, was able to keep a team, expand the team, and keep a team there uh, protecting people for a, a decade because that the, the, the level of violence continued very heavy mm -hmm. and uh, protected people and every single person that they protected, whether it was a human rights lawyer, sometimes it was a, a monk, a controversial Buddhist monk, or someone like that. Um, Everyone that they accompanied remained alive mm. uh, uh, during that period. So it, it was it was really a remarkable 
track record. My vulnerability, a friend of mine uh, who was a lawyer in this country and who was scared to death that I was going to Sri Lanka said, look, let me buy you a gun. I'll just buy you a gun. You know, just take a gun with you. I said, no, 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 David, you don't understand. The whole point is that I'm nonviolent and it's my vulnerability that's protecting this this lawyer. And they're not allowed to carry a gun either. They have to, they have to lock up their gun if they're going to be protected by us. And uh, he said, no. Come on, George, just take a gun. Just take a gun. Just for me, take a gun. <laughs> so, um, and, and the, the other thing I love about this example, and, and now it's, 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 you know, more and more accepted in the world of NG, international NGOs that mm -hmm. such a thing exists and more and more people are doing it. And, uh, but what I loved about it one of the things I loved about it was it's so contrary to common sense. How do you defend yourself against his squad yeah. without violence? Obviously, the only way to be a bodyguard is to have violence. And so the, the very uh, flying in the face of uh, common sense uh, was itself a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the reason I like that is because a beautiful thing about the study of nonviolence I've discovered my own life over and over and over is it very often is contrary to common sense because common sense mm. has been shaped by a culture of violence. Mm. And so common sense isn't actually, you know, some, <laughs> isn't, isn't the capital T truth. Right. It's shaped by the institutions of violence, the huge mm. Pentagon, the whole, you know, the whole deal in, in all countries. And so, uh, yeah, so it's it's really fun to be able to be in on breakthroughs of that kind, mm -hmm. and I recommend it to you know everybody who's paying attention to this particular interview that if you want to be on the cutting edge, if you want to go beyond common sense, one way to do it is to get serious about the potential of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is that is incredible. Um, yeah, when I first saw the f the phrase "unarmed bodyguard," I was sort of confused. I mean, it really does seem like a crazy, <laughs> <laughs> insane idea. Doesn't it sound but, crazy? Yeah, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but it's, it's incredible that it's incredible that you were able to make it out one piece and that you it really did save lives and make a difference. Um, that's that's amazing. Um, I'm, I also think it's um, important because one thing I admire about as I've learned about your career, and one thing I admire about the work that Nonviolence International does is it's, it is truly international, not just focusing on the US, not just working with Americans, but really helping activists um, around the globe. And I think that is really an incredible aspect of the work that you've been doing that NVI has been doing. It's great. Amen. Oh, and I remember it was 1989 that I went oh, to nice. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put note there. <laughs> if you think these conversations are important and would like to see them continue, please consider supporting NVI and the work we do by subscribing to this YouTube channel, following us on Twitter and Facebook, and visiting our website. Also, please consider donating to our organization. Every little bit counts to help build a more just and nonviolent world.